As you know from your reading, watching, and listening during your study of early American history, the English and after 1707 British colonies did not develop in a vacuum. From the start, they contended with competition from each other, indigenous peoples, and other empires. Critically, this phenomenon was not unique to North America or even the Americas. At the same time Europeans were building empires in the Americas, they were doing the same thing around the globe. After all, Christopher Columbus's original intention was to find a trade route with Asia, and America was something of an unexpected surprise. Hello, I'm Troy Bickham, and I'm a professor in the Department of History at Texas A&M University, where I teach and write books on the histories of Britain and its empire and the early United States during the 16th through 19th centuries. Today, I would like to discuss the Global Seven Years War. This is a huge topic explored by many scholars and about which many books and articles have been written. Far too much material to cover completely in a single lecture. In consequence, a short bibliography will be made available, and I encourage you to make use of it if this is a topic you'd like to learn more about. So, my examination will be more of an exploration of some of the key components rather than an exhaustive study of the conflict. We'll look first at its causes, then its beginnings in North America, next at its global spread, and then back to North America for its completion and consequences for American history. By the mid-18th century, the primary European rivals were Britain and France. They had a long-standing disdain for each other that reached back hundreds of years to a time when the two royal families were intertwined. The English nobility spoke French, and English kings held more, more territory in France than in England. Today, the nations are allies, and the rivalry is restricted to humor with images such as this one. But for the better part of 800 years, their struggle was violent and, as we will see, global. In medieval times, their differences were sorted out on small fields like in Agincourt or Cressy by a few thousand armed men. By the 1750s, however, they were global powers and they had exported their rivalry around the world. They each had colonies in West Africa. They also competed for African slaves to work their respective Caribbean sugar and coffee plantations. They each had their own East India companies tasked with promoting Asian trade and colonization and they each maintained professional armies and navies to protect and extend their empires. They also both had long established colonies in North America. Now to be clear, the differences were not simply about competition and trade. In the national imagination, the British and French viewed each other as fundamentally culturally different. The British were Protestant, had a constitutional monarchy, an elected parliament, enjoyed greater personal freedoms, such as freedom of speech, than almost any other country on earth. They also had a comparatively higher standard of living. The French were more numerous. They were ruled by an absolute monarch, I no legislature to, to curb uh, monarchical power. They were Catholic and had limited personal freedoms. Leaders emphasized these differences to drum up popular support for wars against each other. And generally, it worked. When war erupted between the two empires in 1755 in what would be known in Europe as the Seven Years' War, it was not the first or last time. However, the stakes this time were much, much greater than a fresh title, a princess, or a strip of small land in Europe. At stake, potentially, was the claim to be the dominant European imperial power. This was a war for the globe. So first off, why is it called the Seven Years' War? Um, well, it wasn't at the time, and it didn't last for seven years either. In British North America, the conflict was refer referred to mostly as the French and Indian Wars, which itself was an umbrella for the war with France, as well as a semi series of semi-related isolated conflicts, such as the Cherokee War and Pontiac's Uprising. In India, it was the Third Carnatic War and Bengal War. Central Europe typically referred to it as the Third Silesian War. Eurocentric historians since have referred to it as the Great War for Empire. 
Now, the estimates of casualties globally vary, but amongst the more persuasive guesses is about 1.4 million people died as a result of this conflict. The spark for the war came in 1754 in the borderlands of North America. As this map shows, the British, French, and Spanish all had competing claims over North America, some more recognized than others, not to mention the Native Americans who did not always recognize European claims and pursued their own diplomatic paths. The borderlands, as indicated by the striped lines, were especially contested. During the 18th century, British and French colonies were growing at a steady pace, increasingly crash clashing with one another. In the early 1750s, the contest was primarily over the area of what is now West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, and parts of New York. But the French and the British claimed it, and it was some of the most fertile land in the world. Of course, there was a great difference between claiming and controlling land in North America. The reality of the situation on the ground was that the area was populated by a hodgepodge of Native Americans, such as the Miami, Shawnee, and Delaware, who had flooded the areas as refugees from European imperial expansion. Their overlords were nominally the Iroquois Confederacy, whose homelands were the Great Lakes region during this period, and they operated very much like an empire. The Iroquois had successfully used their position in between the British and French empires to their advantage, playing the European powers against each other and acting as trading intermediaries between Europeans and other Native Americans. Hendrick, as he was known to the English, seen here, um, is displaying clothes that were a gift for the British king. He was a sachem amongst the Iroquois who played the cultural role of cultural intermediary between the British, French, and other Native Americans, mixing both trade and diplomacy very successfully. This worked for several generations, but by the 1750s, the Iroquois Empire was starting to crumble, which opened opportunities for the British. French, and critically, the Native Americans who had lived under the Iroquois yoke. The French, in exchange for support in building and supplying forts in the contested region, offered these peoples guns and other trade goods. This was mutually beneficial. The French were able to block British expansion and gain Indian trade. The Indians in the region got support in throwing off their Iroquois masters and thus a greater degree of independence. Virginia grew nervous for two reasons. First, they didn't like the idea of the French building forts in what they saw as their own backyard. Second, they were fearful that their colonial rivals, particularly Pennsylvania and New York, might throw the French out first and thus claim the land for themselves. You see, Western borders, as shown in this map from the time, were vague and contested, not just between different empires, but also the different colonies within the same empire. The British kept control of the colonies partly by ensuring that London was the hub. They did this through limiting direct intercolonial trade, except by explicit permission for specific goods, and essentially administering the colonies as separate little nations. Each colony had its own distinct laws, its own systems of government, its own currency, and its own local militia, established religion, etc. In essence, they were rivals for British affection rather than a team. So what did Virginia do? Well, they sent out the militia to push out the French, led by a young Virginian named George Washington, seen here in his Virginia militia uniform. Inexperienced and grossly overmatched by the French professionals in the area, Washington and his ragtag band of militia were quickly routed then forced to surrender, then compelled to sign a document recognizing it was their fault for starting hostilities. Upon hearing the news, the British government had two options. First, they could ignore it as colonial bickering. In general, European governments treated clashes in the colonies as what happens in the colonies stays in the colonies, and thus enabling pretty much a continuous Cold War that did not necessarily have to spread to Europe. The second option was to get involved, and the British chose the latter. The next summer, the British had sent a force of over 2,000 professional regular troops, 
under the command of a hand-picked general to take Fort Duquesne, which was the French port in what's now Western Pennsylvania. With the aid of some Virginia militia that include George Washington, they marched into the July American wilderness and soon were surrounded by a smaller force of French soldiers, militia, and their American Indian allies. The British were slaughtered. And for the next year, war parties of French and Indians massacred civilians up and down the British frontier, causing panic, a wave of fleeing refugees, and economic carnage. At this point, the British decided to go all in, preparing for a long war in North America and sending tens of thousands of troops with the goal of eliminating the French Empire in America altogether. Such a commitment was unprecedented. It was one thing for the French to sort of ignore colonists shooting at each other, quite another to disregard multiple armies campaigning. The war soon spread to Europe and across the globe as a host of local conflicts merged into one great world war centered on the British and French. The British strategy in the Seven Years' War was a sea change shift. The aim was to hold the French and their allies in Europe while conquering enemy possessions around the globe. The British had a great navy built by years of investment, and so they aimed to cut off the French from their colonies and then go about conquering them. Led by William Pitt, seen here, the change reflected a changing Britain. You see, Britain, um, you see, Pitt was not an aristocrat at the time, which was very unusual for a leading minister. Rather, he was the son of wealthy merchants who had made their fortunes largely from imperial trade. Colonies were um, worth much more at the time in terms of revenue than European holdings. And um, the British, under the leadership of men like Pitt, increasingly thought of their nation as something like a corporation. Um, with a mindset that's pretty widespread in modern societies today, but very revolutionary back then, men like Pitt saw the government's role as creating wealth, promoting trade and developing and looking after the national economy. And this way of thinking, the armed forces were a tool, you know, not just for protecting the king's honor, but for also protecting and expanding the national economy. War, therefore, was something of an investment and the British proceeded to borrow and invest more than at any point in their prior history. The fighting in Europe, though intense, had relatively little to do with Britain. Britain called up its militia in case of invasion, and its massive navy secured the water around its islands. The British sent troops to fight alongside their allies in Europe, but mostly they sent financial subsidies and aid to keep their allies in the field. Those allies were few, Portugal and some German states, notably Prussia, which was the largest German state at the time. The French-led coalition included Russia, Sweden, Spain, Austria, and some German states. Quite surprisingly, Prussia hung on. Its capital, Berlin, was taken multiple times and its king, Frederick II, became known as Frederick the Great. They fought to the point of exhausting themselves and their enemies, leaving the British to sweep up around the globe. Known primarily as the Third Carnatic War and the Bengal War, the conflict in Asia, particularly South Asia, was a huge success for the British. The British presence in Asia was dominated by the British East India Company. Founded at the start of the 17th century, the East India Company was a publicly traded company with stocks and shares, a board of directors, and a headquarters in London, not unlike companies today such as Tesla or Amazon. Its job was to manage British trade with all of Asia, not just what now, what's now modern India. They were based in Kolkata, but had other operating bases in the region. By the mid-18th century, it was not only the wealthiest company in Britain, it was an emerging power in Asia. It had a small army, a little navy, and lots of ambition. Meanwhile, the Mughal Empire, which ruled over what's now most of India, was in a fragile state, enabling its various vassal provinces and kingdoms to kind of fracture and to pursue their own conflicting ambitions and policies. 
all of the European imperial powers, which had their own East India companies, and there were several, saw opportunities in India and, like circling jackals, pounced on a wounded beast. France was Britain's main rival in the region, as it was in much of the world, and war between them was intertwined with existing conflicts and rivalries in Asia. Via a combination of victories over Mughal forces and local forces loosely allied with the French, the British East India Company, which also relied heavily on their own Indian allies, became a territorial power, territorial power by the end of the war. They effectively became the rulers, by a series of treaties, of Bengal and two adjacent provinces. This had two key implications. First, it meant that the primary revenue stream for this publicly traded company, the East India Company, was no longer about trade and commerce. Rather, the primary revenue stream was taxes of local peoples. Seen here is the new headquarters built with its profits. Lavishly decorated and furnished, its counting room or treasury room featured this specially commissioned painting on its ceiling in which a supplicant Indian is handing over all of her riches to Britannia. The second major consequence of all this was that the East India Company now governed more people in Asia than lived in Britain, roughly 20 million in Asia versus Britain's roughly eight. For the next two centuries, this meant that the majority of people in the British Empire would be Asian. The British Empire was no longer primarily an empire of trade and settlement, which was the foundation of the North American colonies. Rather, it was now an empire of conquest and rule of indigenous peoples. Back in the Americas, progress was less smooth. British colonists outnumbered the French colonists by more than 20 to 1, and British naval supremacy severely hampered France and its ability to supply its colonies in the Americas. Yet, the British were continually thwarted for the first few years. Now, there was plenty of blame to go around, but the myriad of problems boiled down to roughly two. First was that most American Indians sided with the French, at least the American Indians who participated in the conflict. The French Empire was largely about trade with native peoples. The British was largely about settlement and agriculture. One depended upon um, preservation of the Native Americans as potential consumers and trading partners. The other required their removal, if not eradication. The choice for most American Indians, therefore, was clear. In fact, the Indians so loathed the British, well, really the British colonists, that they continued to fight alone for a further two years after the British and French came to peace terms. American Indians were crucial to the war effort because most fighting was in their territory, not the heavily populated, populated eastern seaboard. Their style of fighting, referred to as Indian, irregular, or wilderness warfare, worked well in the forests of North America, honed by a, a millennia of fighting. Because you see, in the forests of North America, wearing bright red coats, marching in formation, and beating on drums was, well, to say the least, a major disadvantage. Now, the British ultimately adapted, forming light infantry ranger companies that moved quickly, carried limited supplies, chose their own weapons, and wore clothing more suitable to the task. This was the beginning of special forces in Western armies. This was exemplified by Robert Rogers, seen here, whose rules of rangering are still in print and read in special forces training around the globe. But these adjustments took several years and the removal of multiple failed commanders. Now, the second reason causing problems for the British in the early years was that the colonists were a fairly unruly lot of people. They undermined the British war effort by quarreling with the American Indians and each other. Remember, the colonies were not created to work in harmony. They competed with each other for British favor and were different in culture, economy, and ethnic makeup. They had different laws, separate military forces, separate religious preferences, different currencies, and critically, different policies and treaties with various American Indian nations. In fact, it was not uncommon for one colony to be at war 
with a group of American Indians who were receiving weapons and supplies from another. This image is likely a familiar one to any of you who have studied the American Revolution when it was a popular symbol. It depicts a rattlesnake, often the animal representative of North America at the time, and it's divided into multiple parts, each of which represents a British colony or a group of colonies. The tail, for example, is marked SC, or South Carolina. The caption is clear, join the parts together or die separately. This image, however, was not originally the product of the American Revolution. Rather, it was first printed in Benjamin Franklin's Philadelphia newspaper at the outset of the Seven Years' War. The enemy was France, who would destroy the British colonies if they did not cooperate with each other and the mother country. It was a plea for unity with, with each other and Britain in the, for, the, for, in the face of great adversity. After their initial failures, the British imperial response was to assert a strong central authority during the war, placing militias and governors under the command of the British commander-in-chief in America, forcing both coordination and obedience. They also took Indian affairs out of the hands of the colonies and put them under the authority of the British commander-in-chief. But again, this took a little time. Eventually, however, the British found success, starting with 1759's celebrated capture of the walled fortress city of Quebec. By 1760, French military presence had largely been eliminated from North America and dealt a severe blow in the Caribbean. In consequence, the British gained what is now Canada from the French, uncontested claim over the lands east of the Mississippi River, and Florida from Spain, in the treaty that would conclude the war between Britain and France in 1763. When the dust finally settled, the British victory was massive. They had largely swept the French from India and North America, and they were the dominant power in the world's oceans, which gave them a huge advantage in terms of trade routes, including that of the highly lucrative African slave trade. Britain was and would remain the dominant European imperial power for the better part of the next two centuries. So aside from the geopolitical consequences, there were major changes in how the British perceived and ran their empire. And I now like to turn to our attention to those subjects. The Seven Years' War marked the beginning of the British seeing themselves as an imperial people. Sure, the colonies had been around for 150 years, but they received relatively little attention in the British press or from the British government. For example, 40 years before the Seven Years' War, four Iroquois leaders traveled to Britain to drum up support for an attack on French America. The effort generally failed, the attack never happened, but the leaders, or Indian kings as they came to be known, caused a great stir, attracting popular crowds and published stories about them. Popular British understanding of the world, however, was such that they were merely treated as exotics. Um, after all, um, the word Indian itself was often uh, conflated both people in the Americas and Asia. And in fact, Indian for a long time meant basically anything that was not European. The resulting images soon looked like this in terms of their coverage of these visitors as the British sought to incorporate these so-called Indian kings into their own understanding of the world. And you'll notice that uh, the first makes them look like a group of European medieval kings, much like a deck of cards. The second keeps four in the title, but reduces the number to three and surrounds them with images of the Orient, anything they could think of that was exotic. Things like pyramids, one striking a King Tut-like hieroglyphic pose, and there's even the Star of David in the background. In short, they had become conflated with the stories of the Magi, or the three wise men, from the biblical accounts of Christ's birth. In fact, a notorious London gang at the time renamed themselves the Mohawks in the 1720s in an effort to appear super tough. However, all of their symbols, including turbans and crescent tattoos, were decidedly Asian, not American. And although many commented on the gang, no one seemed to notice the confused imagery at the time. This changed dramatically during the Seven Years' War which dominated the British press and the public sphere 
for the better part of a de decade. The press was packed full of information, stories, charts, eyewitness accounts, and lots and lots of maps that could be pulled out, tucked into one's coat pocket, and taken to the local coffee house for debate, where all the armchair generals gathered. When Ostanaka, a Cherokee leader, traveled to London in 1762 towards the end of the war, the response, public response, was considerably different to that of the four Indian kings 50 years earlier. The Cherokee had started as British allies in the Seven Years' War, but a separate war erupted when local colonists used the opportunity to attack a number of boarding and largely defenseless Cherokee towns and peoples. The British press erupted in debates over the future of Cherokee relations and policies in the wake of the visit. The coverage included accurate images of Ostanaka, as well as charts and maps of Cherokee territory, such as this one in the London Magazine. In this context, for the first time, imperial victories were celebrated as much as European ones. When French regimental flags were captured overseas, they were shipped to London, where they were paraded triumphantly through the street streets, sometimes ceremonially trampled, and then displayed in great public spaces like Westminster Abbey. When Quebec was captured, there was public euphoria in Britain that lasted for days a euphoria that had been previously reserved for only the greatest European victories. One of the most iconic and recognizable images of the age is Benjamin West's Death of Wolfe, seen here. Wolfe was the gallant British commander at Quebec who died taking the city. His death is celebrated by West as Christ-like, martyrdom for the British state, in which the cross is exchanged for British flag. West is dying for the British, and that he is doing so overseas makes his sacrifice no less great. So now we have a national public that is increasingly interested in the empire, a nation that sees itself and by extension the empire as a business, searching for economic opportunities that will benefit the shareholders, i.e. the people of the nation and a new vast empire of all sorts of oddly cobbled together parts. So how is the British government to run and rule this empire? Well, like most businesses that make new major acquisitions, the British asserted greater central control in the name of efficiency. It was a new empire, an empire of authority. And as we move towards the American Revolution, all of this had mixed consequences, to say the least. 